Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Full Time Whistle podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by former Leeds United and Wing Athletic left back Kevin Sharp. So, Kevin, how are you doing? Good, thanks, Jay. Yeah, how are you? All good. I'm, uh, I'm great, and thanks so much for joining me. So, first and foremost, it would make sense to start this conversation where it all began. You started your youth career at the French club AJ Oxair. How did you end up your football career uh, playing in France? Well, I was playing for, for England schoolboys at the time and um, myself and a, a guy called Jamie Forrester um, were probably one of the few that hadn't been signed for an English club. And um, we played against uh, France um, at Wembley and um, they had scouts, or they had scouts watching some of their players who were playing for France um, against us. And we... We impressed and um, the scout after the game um, made contact with my parents, my, you know, my, my father um, and invited us to go along and, and really go out there and have a look at the setup. And um, Augsburg was one of them clubs where it was renowned, certainly European wide and, and, and developed to be worldwide, at creating some of the best young players um, and producing the best best young players in their first team and allowing them that chance and giving them out that opportunity. So naturally hearing these sort of things, we were, we were, you know, I certainly was interested in going out and having a look and, and seeing what it's like. Um, so that, that's where it sort of began and, um, and, and, and went from there and every sort of school holiday, if you will, we went out there um, and, and, you know, tried to mingle in with the with the players and get a feel of the place and and the players and the staff and the club itself. It sounds brilliant. And as a young player, what is it like to obviously make the decision to go live away from home in a country where the language is different? You have to learn a new language. I imagine they are English speaking uh, in France, but obviously it's it's learning a new language, a new culture at such a young age. Yeah, it was it was very difficult. Um, when we eventually signed, um, I mean, I, I'd never taken, we had an option at school to take a language and I'd never took any language. So, whereas Jamie Forrest had, had taken a language, so he sort of knew a little bit of French. I knew nothing, literally the basics, you know, of hello and goodbye. Um, so I was really thrown in the deep end. I mean, fortunately enough, and we're, we're all a bit, you know, ignorant to this, we rely on, you know, others speaking English and, and, and a lot of the French boys and the coaches spoke English, which was great. But uh, yeah, I was throwing the deep end and, and I vaguely remember, well, I, I firmly remember doing an interview within like three weeks of arriving at Orgs and it was live on on um, their main channel on TV. And the manager, Guy Roux, um, insisted we did it in French. And I'd only, I'd only have been there three weeks. <laughs> it was literally, I'd had three lessons or four lessons of French. So I had to script it and literally remember it word by word what I was going to say and being told what questions I was going to um, going to answer really. But it was it was it was tough, not easy. Certainly at that age, you know, with with the mental issue of leaving home, because uh, previous to that I'd been at Lillyshaw, which is in England, um, an FA school. So I'd moved home really from fourteen. So from fourteen to sixteen, I was at Lillyshaw, and then I went straight to France. So I'd really, um, you know, which Lillyshaw was based in Birmingham. My family were based in Lancashire, in Blackpool. So really I'd left home from 14, which was quite, you know, quite difficult to deal with at the time. And um, the adjustments were, were hard, but the football was great. I couldn't complain on that side of it. You learn learned the game in France. How did you uh, develop there and, and what did you learn, which might be different to academies in the UK? Yeah, certainly. It was... Um, at that time, it was just before the influx of, of Arsene Wenger and, and the players he brought to England. So France, French football was was really uh, quite strong and dominant throughout Europe. Um, and I developed untold. I wasn't, I was, I was technically okay before I went, but I wasn't technically sound and um, on a level where I needed to compete at a, a better level. Um, and going to France made me technically more sound everything was ball related um everything was controlled your diet uh, your lifestyle 
uh, you were put into a, an academy. Um, it was called the Pyramid um, in, in Nogza. Um, and you were watched daily. You, your weight was taken daily. Um, so all these things were, were literally what we're seeing now in, in England and, and probably it's pretty similar to what Arsene Wenger brought to England with, with Arsenal and, and all the top players he brought over. But um, that was in Europe and certainly in France and what I experienced was um, it happened a, you know, a, long, a long time ago in, um, in Orgs there and, and, and probably a lot of other clubs in, in France for that matter. It was a, a really interesting concept to obviously go away and play in France with the new culture and the new environment. What do you miss about France and what did you particularly like about living there? Well, France, I mean, it's a lovely country. You know, where Augsburg was situated, it was, it was probably around an hour and a half, two hours from Paris if you're heading sort of south. Um, and it was a, a village which, which was probably the size of or a town that's probably the size of something like Wigan, if not smaller. Um, so you're in a little bit of a goldfish bowl, to be quite honest. Um, but everything about the place, it was it was nice, the scenery, the um, the place itself, it was a real historic town. Um, but also the, you know, the culture, you know, the food, you know, that sort of thing, how, how they actually looked after themselves. It was very different. Um, and it was something that we had to adjust to quite quickly. Um, we did initially, but in time, it, it sort of got quite difficult. Um, for us, but the actual lifestyle itself, we had no complaints. It was uh, it was beautiful. Obviously, you left uh, France to, to return to England uh, in 1992, joining Leeds United, who were then one of the top clubs in England. How did this move come about, and, and what did it feel like to be joining a club like Leeds United? Well, it came about. Um, it, we were oh, at talks there, and we were we were enjoying our, our time to to a degree, and. Um, I became homesick. Um, it was one of the things I'd left home at, like I say, 14. And then um, it came to a stage where I, I basically went to the manager and said, look, I, I'm not enjoying myself at the moment. You know, I, I need to, to be back in England. Um, every t- I was going back quite often, actually, within within my time at Augs Air, playing for the England under-18s um, and meeting up with players. Um and I was missing that sort of, I don't know, camaraderie with, with the English boys. And it was something, and my parents and my family and, and all that sort of stuff. And all the players had, had grown up with them, friends. So it came to the stage where it was a head-to-head with the manager. And I said, look, I, I, need, to, um, I need to explore leaving. He didn't want me to leave. He offered me, you know, a lot of incentives, a new contract to stay. And it's just something I didn't want to do. Uh, so I, um, he basically put my name about to different clubs um, and there was a fee involved. So basically I had to go on a trial uh, within these clubs. So um, Leeds was one of them, Everton was one and Arsenal was one. So they were set up for me to go for a week. And then after each trial, the club would make a decision whether they wanted to sign me or not based on agreeing the fee. Um, so I went to Everton first. Really enjoyed it. Loved it. Howard Kendall was there. Some great players. Loved the training ground. Loved the club. Um, but they're in a position at that time where he wanted someone to go directly into the first team, Howard Kendall, and I wasn't quite ready. Um, so basically that that sort of fell through. I nearly signed there. And then I went to Leeds the week after. And it just clicked. Everything just was perfect. The manager... Paul Hart, who was ultimately I was playing for in the youth team, um, was fantastic. Um, showed me a lot of care and affection and and also played the type of football I like to play. Um, so he was really a big influence in me going to Leeds. Um, and then the Arsenal obviously never came around because I've made a decision. I said, look, I'm not going to go to Arsenal. I want to sign for Leeds. And ultimately, ultimately they, they offered me a deal to to sign for Leeds. As a player, how important is it that the manager obviously shows faith and can clearly see that they want to work with you and, and help you grow and develop as a player, especially at a young age? Well, it's paramount now. And it's certainly in this day and age, it's 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 really important that a player shows, um, uh, sorry, a manager shows a player 
um, care and, and attention and, and really um, just to get the best out of them really more than anything and, and, and give them that attention. Um, every, every person and every player is different. So a manager has to treat them that way. Um, we all have our own issues, whether it's on the pitch or off the pitch. So these things need to be managed. And whether that's by the manager, whether it's by a care team um, within the club, or whether it's an assistant manager, um, it, they have to you know, liaise with, with the right people to get the best out of these players and make sure when they cross over that white line, these players are cared for and they have no other issues, no other mental problems or, or no other um, side issues that they're, they're worried to share about. Uh, and, and in order to do that, in order to get the best performance out of these players, this needs to happen um, because you can't take your problems off the pitch, on the pitch, because through our experience, I've known it doesn't work and you can't get the best out of a player. The, the performance levels suffer. Um, and with their minds and their immature uh, state of mind, they find it hard to deal with and they find it difficult to to combine the two and, and deal with the two. And you can only really explain that if you've been through it. Um, but back to your question, the manager, yeah, certainly, along with others, are, are, are massively important to, to young, certainly young players as well. I think it's really important that you, you mentioned the mental health point because in the modern day and age, mental health, the, the stigma uh, has improved. A lot more people are open to talk about it. But back in the day where you were playing, was mental health uh, a concept for footballers or was it more of a case of uh, get on with it, uh, which was probably the approach back then? Because I know the phrase is man up, uh, used to get thrown around quite a lot. Yeah, it was. And it was it was, it was was basically deal with it as best you can, get on with it. I mean, my, my dad was, you know, he's the biggest influence on my career, you know, but he was always one of them. You know, if, if I got a knock, get up, get up, rub it and run and, you'll be fine and you know and that was whether it be something I had an issue with we didn't really go deep into anything it was sort of yeah brush it aside and, and get on with it and you'll be better for it and be tough and but that was a that was back then you know times change you know and, and certainly have done um since I was growing up um now now it's it's slightly different you know players um suffer with things uh, and deal with things a lot different. Um, now, there's no right and wrong way. You know, it was just eras for me. It was just how we dealt with things. Um, it was certainly the same when I played under experienced players. It's exactly the same. Um, you know, they, they would give you a lot of stick um, and you had to deal with it. You had to get on with it. Um, but I, I can't see that happening a lot now. And um, and I think there's a fine balance of of um, of the mental side, and 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 it's it's you've got to tread careful with it because it's a, a real serious issue at the moment, and uh, it has to be dealt with in the right and correct manner. I think it is really important that you mentioned too that the mental health has a profound impact on a player's performances. Do you use your experiences as a player to to relate to your clients? Because obviously you know how they're feeling because. If you're on the outside where you've never played the professional game or the academy game, you're not quite sure the, the pressure they're under and uh, the environment they're in. Yeah, it's something I, I, I draw on, really. And, and it's one of the reasons why I got involved in the agency game, to be quite honest. It's, um, I've, had, I've had many, you know, a lot of ups and downs and more downs, to be quite honest. And, um, and for me to relate that to a lot of my my clients now, when and if needed, um, it, it's, I'd like to think it certainly helps. Um, I've been fortunate to, to play with some of the best players that developed or have developed into in the world. Um, but I've also, and, and some of the best teams, but I've also played lower down uh, of the football pyramid. So I've been fortunate, less fortunate, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've had knocks, injuries, um, lack of form through my fault, um, reasons off the pitch, lack of form through reasons on the pitch um, and problems, you know, that I brought on myself. So I, I've experienced sort of every avenue of 
of being a footballer, you know, and um, listen, in my early career, I was, I'd like to say I was up there with, with one of the best there was in, in a period of time, you know, in, in Europe. And, but I, 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 was, I became a very average player. And, and it was through my own fault, through lack of probably discipline, through lack of professionalism, and probably through getting carried away of, of what level I'd achieved early on. Um, but these are things I connect, draw on my experience and, and, and relate to a lot of the players, um, myself, my colleague, uh, look after within, within our business. Knowing what you know now about the footballing world, what would you do differently and, and what advice would you give yourself as a young player? Uh, good question. It's it's one where, because times are, are so different, um, I mean, the biggest mistake I made, um, certainly only in my career, was probably two. I, I, I probably shouldn't have left um, France because my game was was coming on very much and, and, and coming on tenfold to be quite honest technically and physically I was I was a far better far better athlete and player um, but then on the flip side I, I went to Leeds and um, was doing really well um, and then again you know Leeds have a, had a fantastic team at the time you know they just won the old uh, League One Division One and then went into the Premier League. But they had Gordon Strachan, uh, Gary McAllister, Dave Batty, Guy Speed. And they had Tony DiRigo, who I was left back and he was in my position. I thought I should have been ahead of him. Now he was an England international. I should never have been ahead of him. I should have just stayed, learned off him, bided my time. And then you, I would have got my opportunity in time, whether it had been at Leeds or elsewhere. But again, I banged the door down with Howard Wilkinson and insisted I left and he just decided look whoever comes in first or shows interest then you're free to talk to him and that happened to be Wigan so um, yeah it, it's, it's a couple of things really I, I think you know that again drawing back to experiences of my own that I can relate to the you know certainly my players um, you know not being too eager to achieve something too early you know, if, if you're good enough and you conduct yourself well, then it'll happen for sure. Um, but, you know, stay grounded, which is massively important. Um, and be honest to yourself and others. It, that's that's crucial as well. Do you think almost a lack of patience uh, in a way affected your career at your early age? Because obviously you mentioned that you felt like you should have been started at Leeds United when, when it was clear that looking back, uh, the person ahead of you was a full England international. You as a young lad coming through, looking to make the, the name in the uh, the industry, the industry. The yeah, 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 it's probably a good point. Yeah, I think lack of patience had something to do with it, okay. um, being too eager to succeed. Um, at that period, we, <coughs> excuse me, we'd won the the FA Youth Cup um, at Leeds United, um, and we'd also won uh, in the same year the Euros with England. So we are rubbing shoulders. I was rubbing shoulders with some fantastic players who, who went on to do unbelievable things. You know, you had Gary Neville, you had Beckham, your Skulls, you had Nicky Butt, um, Robbie Fowlers, all these type of characters, Saul Campbell. <clears throat> and these, I could see them progressing, getting opportunities early, you see, and, and probably playing more consistent than me. And that probably, I was looking at that thinking, well, that should be me, even though I was introduced to the first team quite early. But I wanted, I wanted more, you know, and I had this probably arrogance that I should be playing more. It was wrong. I had a look back now and I thought, you know, I was an idiot at the time. What was I doing? And um, my dad tried to guide me as best he could. You know, he, he was great for me. Um, admittedly, he wasn't involved or I'd never been involved in professional football. Um, but I look back and I, I think, well, if if I was, if I had me, advising me back then I wouldn't have been in that situation because I'd have pulled the reins back on me and and guided me down a better route um and basically said look just stop being an idiot and, and be more patient and your time will come so yeah it's 
I think it is. I think it's, 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 I think it's a positive that you was able to use that negative experience and turn it into a positive. Now looking back with helping your own clients. And to link back to your playing days, how do you reflect on your three years at Ellen Road? Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Made some fantastic friends. Um, some, you know, I look back and say, right, well, if if I hadn't have gone to Leeds and I'd stayed in France, like I said before, and I should have stayed in France, I've got, you know, that's, I've got three kids, you know, um, you know, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, met some fantastic, uh, like I say, friends, but teammates, some top players have played with unbelievable players. Um, so for me, that was, you know, I can't, I can't look back with it and, and go, oh, it was all bad because it wasn't. Um, and I've always stayed in the area, you know, whatever club I've gone to, um, I've, I've tried to commute or for, for the wrong or right reasons, but I've always stayed in the area, which which tells me a lot. Who did you learn from the most uh, during your time at Leeds United in terms of players, managers? Um, certainly at Leeds, I'd have to say Paul Hart was a big influence um, and helped me a lot. Um, very tough, very um, demanding. But he was a mixture of old school and how he treat you, um, you know, psychologically, but then very modern in how he wanted to play the game. So it was a real nice combination and you knew where you stood with him. If you stepped out of line, you were in trouble. Um, and that was both on and off the pitch. You know, he, he was very disciplined, but a good guy, a real genuine good guy. Um, so certainly in my time at Leeds, he was... He was one of the the main influence. And then Gordon Strachan, I'd say, um, he, he sort of like was coming to the end of his career and went into the coaching side. Um, and he sort of started out his coaching really with with our youth team players, myself, um, myself, Noel Whelan, the likes of Jamie Forrest and Mark Tinkler, um, you know, Andy Cousins, Gary Kelly, all these types of players. So he was he was really good and and gave us a lot of encouragement and advice if needed and and when he was coaching. Two great influences to have at, at such a young age and two great players. And during your time at Leeds United, you were also part of the victorious England youth team that won the 1993 UEFA Europa European uh, Under 18 Championship, beat, beating Turkey one in the final. How do you look back, look back on this experience? Well, you look back now, I mean, it's, it's so long ago, it is, it's a little bit of a blur. And, and when it actually happens, it goes so quick. But um, they were just great moments, really. You know, certainly more more so with what the players have gone on, you know, certainly in our squad at that time to do. Um, but that, at the time, it was a fantastic year for us, you know, winning the FA Youth Cup for, for a squad, really, that probably wouldn't be expected to win it. You know, we had a, a good team bond and we had some good players, don't get me wrong. We had some good technical players and but we had a nice blend um, and we should never have won it really, you know, looking at Man United's squad and team. But over the two games, we had that little bit of an edge. We had, you know, two full houses, one at you know, Old Trafford, 36,000 or something, same back at Ellen Road and... You know, they made a difference as well in the second leg, bringing it home. So it was um, great experiences, unbelievable that, you, like you say, they're there, there for life. You can't, you, 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 no one can ever take them away from you, but but fantastic memories. What was your relationship like with the Leeds fans? Good, yeah. Every time I, I played, they showed, they encouraged me. Um, that. Like any fan, really, and any any set of supporters, they're, they're vocal in their opinion. Um, and, it, you know, if you play bad and consistently play bad through lack of effort, that becomes a problem. Uh, and, and they'll make you know. So you have to put the effort in. There's no excuse not to put the effort in as well. So if you're failing through, you know, trying and doing your best and something doesn't quite come off, a uh, pass or, or, or a shot or something, then they'll forgive you. But you've got to put the effort in. And it's like any fans, and, and Leeds were no different. 
So you moved uh, from Leeds United to sign for League Athletic in November 1995 for a club record fee back then of £100,000. £100,000 is a club record back then. It just shows how uh, the transfer market's really inflated over the years from hundred grand to uh, 100 million transfers. <laughs> During your time at the club, you made 217 appearances in six years, winning two trophies to boot. So first and foremost, what attracted you to sign for League Athletic? Well, it was Dave Whelan, really. It was his plan, his um, his idea on, on Wigan, how he sold it to me. Um, basically, as a and it was a plan to to get to the Premier League within ten years. Um, we, you know, turned up at Springfield Park, a great old ground, fantastic open open ground, um, freezing on a, on a cold day, but but. Um, you know, just a traditional English sort of low league ground is fantastic. Um, but he sold me, um, you know, the the dream, if you will, to get to the to the Premier League and be part of that. Um, and he was such a an infectious man, Dave Whelan, and such a a driven man. And how he how he spoke and how he uh, convinced you. Were, was fantastic and 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 what he did he didn't lie he you know he didn't lie he told you exactly what was going to happen and he did it you know within the 10 years he he got to the premier league um now i wasn't part of that but you know he, you know i was part of the process of helping the club to get to that stage um so it was a real honor looking back now for me to be part of that through such a such a fantastic club again with you know talk about Leeds but and Wigan was again a lot of met a lot of fantastic people a lot of genuine people a lot of good characters uh, players um people off the field so it was a it held a special place in my heart Wigan you know on and off the field well, when Dave Whelan initially said that he's aiming to reach the Premier League a lot of people laughed and, and didn't think it was achievable with your conversations did you know back then that his targets were going to be achieved. No, you ne- you never can really. If it's such a small club, and you know, my I'll be totally honest. My aim was to come from Leeds. I was at, I was at the top of my game, if you will, at Leeds, and then I dropped far too low. Really, looking back at, I went from the Premier League to to the lowest league, professional league. You know, I went to League Two. Um, so that was a bit. Again, not great advice. I took my own advice and, and went with it. Um, now, if I was advising someone to do that, I wouldn't. I, I've always advised stay as high as you can for as long as you can. Um, so I wouldn't have done that. But Dave, Dave Whelan's, um is an astute guy, you know, and he sort of like got the feeling he was going to do it at the time. Um, we signed some. The manager was a young up-and-coming manager, John Dean who had previously managed Norwich the season before in the Premier League. So I thought, well, that's a good signing, you know, getting him. And then the players he told me he was going to recruit and they were going to spend a lot of money told me that they were going to get out of that division as well that season. So that sort of like helped my decision as well. Um, but my ultimate aim was really to, to go to Wigan with the greatest respect, was to go to Wigan, a stepping stone back to where I needed to be. And that was my ultimate thought, really. But as time went on, he knew what Dave Woodland was trying to achieve. And he knew with promotions and winning stuff and really being in playoffs and knocking on the door every season, um, it was somewhere where I got really uh, close to in terms of the club, the players, and, and something I wanted to carry out and, and try and stay and achieve a lot more. Um, unfortunately, you know, it didn't end like that. What are your most favourite memories and stories of Dave Whelan? Uh, obviously, he's widely known for being quite the character. He's a, a legend in Wigan for all the right reasons. He's got a statue outside the Deanery Stadium. Obviously, his legacy will never be forgotten when in the FA Cup in 2013. But what are your personal memories of uh, Mr Dave Whelan? Um, just just being always in and around the place, um, but in terms of on a match day, but when he came to the training ground, which is Christopher Park, when I was there, we had we had different training grounds, but it was mainly Christopher Park. Um, he, everyone sort of like knew he was arriving. 
he'd literally virtually park his Jeep on, on the training pitch, <laughs> if not. And one one particular time, I remember uh, Bruce Rioch uh, was manager, I think it was. And um, it was a Monday. I think we just lost uh, on the Saturday through a set piece. Um, and he drove his Jeep right onto the training pitch where we were, got out of his car and said, here, why don't we try this corner? So everything, everyone stopped. Bruce Rioch stopped. All the players stopped. He got me to go over to the corner flag with the ball. He said, just put it in there and Jonesy head it in. And that's all he said. It was, that's how we'll do a set piece and we'll win games. And everyone just looked in amazement. He got back in his Jeep and went back home or wherever he went. It was like, you know, you knew he was always involved, whether he was there or in the background. But just just a, a massive influential character, which, you know, looking at the club now, would love someone like him back involved for sure. You try the, the Connor routine in the next game. We did, yeah, yeah. I, I, we probably scored, to be fair, but it's quite basic. It's you know normally in 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 training, or you try something a lot more complex than that. But the way he sounded, it was, and the way he did it was um was very basic to say the least. But uh, I'm sure we did, yeah. yeah. In 1997, you helped with Athletic win promotion to Division Two. What are your profound memories from that very successful campaign? Got to be Springfield Park and the celebrations has to be. It was just, it, it felt like there was a hundred thousand fans there. You know, is that the celebrations were unreal? Unreal. It was that in, intense and that uh, emotional. Um, it was just pff, off another scale, and it was just memories again. You know, you you never get back, but but great to be a part of. And some great characters, great supporters, um, who have got you know we're gonna have got a hardcore fans who are, who are really loyal, really passionate, and really care about the club. And as they're showing now, and um, for them it was it was special. And and clearly you know them that day was remarkable and uh, um, something I'll never ever forget. You went on to earn a piece of silverware at the club uh, when you won the 1998-99 Football League trophy, uh, winning against Millwall in the final. What do you remember on that special day at Wembley? Again, that was a. It was. I just remember the atmosphere. It was, it was a good win. Um, good goal from Dodge Paul Rogers, um, and it was a close encounter. To be fair, you know, it was, Millwall were always a decent side. Um, had some good players, fantastic players, Neil Harris, Tim Cale, um, just to name a, to name a couple. And um, I remember again the atmosphere. Millwall had probably fifty thousand or something, and we had like eight or or nine. But you wouldn't have thought that, you know, as as mad as it was, the sound when when we scored was unbelievable, um, and the celebrations again. So again, a special moment um, playing at Wembley. The old Wembley was always special. Something that was um, was so different. I feel to to the new one, or is so different. Um, but yeah, mem- memories that will will be there forever. In the following, yeah. he did return to Wembley in uh, the nineteen ninety nine to two thousand season, but unfortunately, it ended in playoff heartache as a. Uh, the Latics lost 3-2 to Gillingham after extra time, where you gained quite an unwanted title to be the last player to ever be sent off at the old Wembley. Uh, what were your thoughts on, on that standing off and obviously uh, that game where we unfortunately lost to Gillingham? Um, it was a game where, again, you know, Gillingham were, were a decent squad, had a good manager in Peter Taylor, well organised, always very physical under Peter Taylor. You know, they were big, strong um always matched it toe for toe. You'd have to probably eventually beat them if you matched them through some skill or, or technical uh, aspect of your game. But um, we, we thought we'd have the beating of them. Um, you know, it obviously didn't work out that way, but, um, you know, that game for me personally, being sent off was, was obviously heartache. Um, something, again, 
you know, regret. Um, I should never have gone to ground. The actual tackle itself, I didn't actually touch the player, <clears throat> but um, I should never have gone to ground. I should have used my experience. I've been booked and stayed on my feet, um, but it, it wasn't to be. And again, yeah, the last player to be sent off at Wembley in a competitive is in a pub, I'm sure. Um, not many people have probably got the answer to, but yeah, it was. But it was a great, a great occasion with the run end result, you know. And um, the lads did brilliant when I went off, absolutely brilliant, and tried the best to to stay in the game, but it wasn't to be. Is it fair to say that yeah. you became a firm fan favourite at Springfield Park? You didn't always see eye to eye with the management team during your time. At Springfield. Yeah, probably fair to say. Not with all managers, because I went through quite a lot of managers in my time, but probably, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that. Um, again, probably taking my uh, my outspoken attitude from from being young probably followed with me, you know, and, and if I wasn't playing or I was dropped or I, I made it known that I should have been, you know, in, in no uncertain terms. and But it might have affected certain managers or... I don't know, but you know, I, some man just dealt with it. Some man just didn't like it. Some man just trapped me in in a different way and 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 wouldn't play me. So uh, I knew what came with that. It's just how I did things, and I never really changed throughout my my career. Really, who were the best players that you played with that week athletic? Um, there's a lot, a lot of really good players. A lot of in different ways. Um, for skill, for for just pure, you know, drive and and determination and attitude, and there's there's many, but um, I'd probably have to say Ariane Dazou. You know, to actually play alongside him for for many years in 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 a couple of different formations, he'd play left either centre half or left in a three at the back, and I'd play wing back or left back. So he was probably one of the probably because he covered for me that many times and got me out of the got me out of the crap so many times. But he's but a great guy as well, top guy. But I'd probably say Ariane, yeah. What a great player, a great suggestion. He's obviously a club legend. And in July earlier this year, to relate to more recent times, Wig Athletic entered administration to the shock of the footballing world. What were your reaction when you found out? Sad. I have to I'd, I'd just say sad, really, you know, because of just all the memories I've mentioned, what we've just been discussing now. And I think, well, how can this come to to a club like Wigan, who, don't get me wrong, you know, from, from where we started, where the club started to get to where they have been, it takes extra hard work, you know, because you're fighting against a lot of elements. You know, you haven't got the support base. Um, you're surrounded by, you know, a catchment area of, Liverpool, Manchester, Manchester clubs, Everton, Blackburn, Burnley, Bolton, all these clubs that are, are huge in their own right. So we're getting fighting against that. And then to, to go into administration, it was, was really sad. And for someone to, to treat the club like that, after all the effort and hard work Dave Whelan had put in, was extremely hard to take. And, and like I say, we're going we're gonna to a club very close to my heart and, and I still still speak to a lot of people connected with the club, um, and it and it hurt me. It hurt me in, in a big way, and, and it still does. Seeing them, you know, where they are now, it, I just cannot believe that there isn't somewhere out, someone out there who can really, you know, take Wigan back to where they were, like a like a Dave Whelan, you know, a similar sort of character, you know, someone who's going to really um, get Wigan back. On, on the map and where, where they deserve to be. At the moment, the Spanish team is currently subject to FL approval. Are you hoping that this could be resolved as soon as possible so we can start getting back to where they were and uh, going on that road to recovery? Well, it has to be. There's no other way. It has to be that way. Um, on, on, you know, it can't stay in the administrators. I'm sure now they're they're wanting to get things sorted out now and get out of the building and, and there needs to be, you know, a resolution there and, and it needs to be not anyone. I know the Spanish, you know, guys are in there, but it has to be the right people and I really hope they are because 
you know, it, surely it can't get any worse, you know, from what it's been. And um, I, I really generally hope that. Absolutely. Oh, We're all hoping for a, a happy resolution soon. To link back to yourself now and, and, and your career, uh, since you've retired from football, uh, after after you left Wigan, obviously you went on to play for the likes of Wrexham, Shrewsbury Town, Hamilton Ackies in uh, Scotland. Uh, you've obviously retired and obviously transitioned into a football agent. How did that transition from a player and agent start and when did you decide this is what you wanted to do? Um. It was sort of like when I when I retired and when I'd, I'd finished playing, um, it was Graham Jones, a yes, Wigan good friend of mine. Um, he was up at Hamilton at the time and I was in between um, I'm just stay, thinking of carrying on playing or not going into coaching. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, so he said, look, come up here and play, you know, come up part time, um, come up on a Thursday or Friday play a game on the Saturday and go back home, you know, and that, it was a few quid in my hand. And so I did that. Um, so was, I'm forever grateful for Graham for, for doing that to me. And I'm still close to Graham. He's a good friend of mine. And um, it was then when I thought I need to, and I, it should have been far earlier than that. You know, I always advise my players now to start whatever they're, they're thinking of wanting to do in retirement, do it while you're playing. But I never did that. I just did it when it happened um, and I had a couple of years out after Hamilton I played part time for a season um, and then I decided I needed to do something I got a call off a friend of mine Martin Bradley who was involved with a, a company called First Eleven Sports which is another agency and he and Paul Masterton um, were there and they asked me if I wanted to come and add my experience and knowledge to the business um, and try and recruit more players. So that's what I did. You know, I did, I did that and um, we, we developed the business. They already had a client base of, of some good players uh, throughout the leagues. Um, and we added to that and develop, developed the business um, into a stronger, better place. And it was a niche where I felt comfortable with and I felt you know, it, it's the second best thing to play in, really. I didn't enjoy coaching. Tried it, dabbled with it, didn't enjoy it. Um, I got my qualifications up to my B licence. Didn't really go for me. But this was something I really took to and, and really enjoyed. And and sh sharing my experiences um, was something. And seeing people take that on board um, and bring into their careers is, is really... You know, satisfying. What is your blueprint to being a football agent? What is your philosophies and, and, and ways to help develop and improve your clients? Um, well, I've got with myself and my colleague, uh, Martin, I've got our own, got our own ways. You know, there's many agents out there, big agencies. And, you know, we've, we've never confessed to being a, a big agency. We, we have a, you know, a pot of players, the portfolio of players who we like to, you know, look after and give them the time and manage and, and do our best for them, for them all, give them equal time, whether you're playing in the National League or whether you're playing the Premier League, they're all the same. And we give them that combined time. Um, but it's simple, really. They Ultimately, they have to do the business on the pitch. Now, if they do the business on the pitch, we take care of everything off the pitch, you know, and, and that's what we... We instill to the players, you know, and, and if they have any problems, we're always there to speak to, whether that's younger age, older age, whatever age. Um, and we really monitor their careers like it'd be our own son's career. So it's with detail, um, with dignity and, and real um, microsco microscopic um, detail where we have to... Um, source the best information in order for them to produce their best performances. So if that entails, um, you know, looking at their stats, detailed information on sort of like on the field, uh, off the field, then that so be it. But we, we try and cover every base possible um, to make these players feel as comfortable as they can 
as secure as they can um, to forge their own careers. Now, that, now, if that ends up being in League One, fine. That's the level they'll find. If they end up being in National League, that's the level they find. But as long as they've given it the best, you know, there's no stone left unturned from us um, and certainly from them. And they've left everything out there possible because it's a short career. Why not? Why not be dedicated to your profession? Why not give everything? Um, there's no reason not to now. You get the best support, best training facilities you've got. Um, and I'd like to think we offer the best agents advice possible as well. Um, more of a caring uh, understanding and a family feel to it. Um, so yeah, we, we've got a niche in that way where we're a little bit different to others. Um, and then, and we have a, a financial arm within my business where they, they take care of all the, the financial matters as well. Um, so yeah, we, we have a we have a different sort of uh, outcome on it than probably most agents. That was absolutely fascinating to hear because it's really nice to see that you help manage outside influence as well, not just matters on the field with the finances and, and obviously helping them as a person as well as a player. And for the audience, what kind of players do you represent and who would be quite well known to them? I'd like, I'd like to mention them all because they all mean, you know, a lot. You know, they mean in different ways, you know, because we've had some players <clears throat> that are longer than others. But at this moment, we've got young players at, at young clubs. We've got Scott Smith at, at Wigan, who's forging his ways injured at the moment, but we will be back soon. Um you know, we've got young players at other other clubs, um, you know, but in terms of the ones who are progressing at, at the top of the game at the moment, in terms of, we've got Calvin Phillips at Leeds United, who's, who's involved in England now. Um, but Liam Palmer, who's at Sheffield Wednesday, who's a Scotland international, involved with Scotland now. Um, we've got an established centre-half in Mark Beavers, who's... Um, play consistently at a really good level and a really good professional. Um, so he's you know, developed into a fantastic person and a professional as well. Um, Tom Pierce, another at Wigan Athletic, great potential, unbelievable uh, character and technical player, um, but needs more games. So we're looking at, at Tom as being one for the, the future. Um, and hopefully with Wigan and getting them back to where they need to be. Um, Lewis O'Brien at Huddersfield, a real top, developed into a top championship centre midfielder. And another one, great character, unbelievable um, intensity to his play and engine, in it, engine as a midfielder and, and great technical ability in terms of you can see a pass and, um, and create things out of nothing. Uh, so we've got a, an array of different players, you know, goalkeepers from Sam Slocum, who's at Notts County, a great, another great character, Richard O'Donnell at, at Bradford, um, captain of the club. All good people, you know, all, all really genuine people who um, you don't have any worries with in terms of um, their loyalty. You know, they're, they're looking inward, you know, if any problems rather than outward. Um, and they want to do the best for, for them and their families um, and, and, and try and create a, a career that they're going to be proud of and they can tell their, their future kids or kids when they retire. What well, else? Well, well, obviously closer to home for myself, Tom Pierce, uh, young Scott Smith, who obviously was a Wig Athletic under 18 as captain. He helped them win that treble in, I think it was uh, 2018 to 19. And He's such a phenomenal talent. And obviously, Mark Beavers, like you said, an experienced centre-half. He's played for Millwall, both Bolton. Uh, he's been at some great clubs. And the list goes on. And obviously, the one player that will catch the eye from the average viewer is Calvin Phillips. Obviously, a full-born England international now. Uh, he's been excellent over the years for Leeds United. Obviously, a local lad to Leeds too. Uh, the one thing I've, already, I've always noticed about Calvin is he seems very humble. I've, I've never met him before, but in his interviews I've seen with him, I've always been impressed with his mannerisms and his mentality because he has that grounded re response to the game. And I think it's very important to have for a player of his, his ability because not only does he have uh, the, the ability of a top player, he has that mindset 
of a player who obviously is confident in his own ability, but he's also grounded with it. And do you help your players with the mentality? So obviously you mentioned in your career uh, when you was playing that sometimes your, your attitude and your attitude to the game might not have been the best approach when you look back. Sorry, it just froze again. It just, it just, it just went off again. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'll, uh, I'll just say the point again. I was, I was just saying like, obviously Calvin Phillips has a top mentality as well as top ability. And during your career, uh, you you probably say that sometimes you might have uh, misjudged situations uh, in terms of attitude and approaches to situations. How do you use those experiences as a player to help the players with their mentalities and attitudes to play in the game? And obviously, waiting for opportunities and obviously opportunities on the pitch too. Yeah, well, again, it's drawing from experiences. One one thing is when you're a young player. Any, any young player can play well in any given moment. The key is getting consistency within your game, and that's across the board. That's in terms of every part of your game. Now, that's the hardest thing to find as a young player, getting consistency. If you, if you find that early uh, and a strong mentality with it, you've got a top player at a young age um, who will develop on to being a, an exceptional player. Now, there's not many players... That, that happens to. Um, the sooner you get that, the better it is for a player. Now, you sort of, you can play a game and play a match and think, right, I played fantastic there. And for the game after, it can be horrendous. Now, trying to explain that and work that out in your own head as a player and trying to explain that to a player is very difficult. Now, there's a reason behind that. It's either... It can be many reasons. It can be the team as a whole didn't play well. As an individual, you didn't feel great. Your preparation wasn't great. And the formation was different. You played in a different formation. Um, your runs were different. The opposition made it harder for you. There's all different you know, uh, aspects of the, the game that might have been affected or affecting you play well in that game. Now, what, I, what you try and do with players is as certainly we do, <clears throat> excuse me, is try and when they play well and when they play bad is keep them on a level. So don't get too high if you've played well, but don't get too low if you haven't played well because that's football. You know, you'll have your ups and downs. But do as well as you can. Make sure it's not through lack of effort. Always learn from the game before, even if you played well, and always learn from the game before if you played bad. So there's always learning experiences to draw on. Um, and and always within the clubs now, the stats, stats available for, for players. After every game, go and get them stats. Go and get the video footage. See where you can improve. Monitor your game. Make it religion. Mate, that's your job. You know, you've got a short career. Make the most of it. And and really try and get the most out of, out of yourself, whether it be physical, tactical, technical, uh, in every aspect of the of a footballer's life, try and um, be as best you can in that short period. I think that's a great uh, approach to the situation because you'll know more than most that consistency is an important thing in football, but some for the other factors you mentioned, it, there's so much more to football that meets the eye especially with outside influences as well as on-field influences. And obviously one player that obviously I'm, I'm going to mention again is Calvin Phillips. What has it been like to represent Calvin and see his progression from obviously starting in the championship with Leeds United to progressing to obviously into the Premier League and then becoming an England international, uh, being recalled up by Gareth Southgate. What is it like to work with Calvin and, and how's, his menta- how's his mentality uh, what is his routines and, and obviously what's it been like as not only a, an agent but as a friend to see his progression to the level he's got to? Again, it, it's a that's the pinnacle, isn't it? Playing for your country is, is every player's dream, you know, certainly obviously who's English. Um within within my stable, um, you know, that's your dream, of course it is, and and Calvin's done that. Um Calvin's like all the other players I've, I've mentioned, um, and just a grounded, down to earth character. His family are exactly the same. His, his mother, his grand, his 
brother and sisters, his girlfriend. Um, he still lives in the area where he grew up, grew up in. Um, <clears throat> he's, he's still got his best friends from school, all the same best friends who he, who he sees a lot. So nothing, nothing in his life has changed too much off the field, um, but on the field it's changed. So that's kept him to a level of, of consistent, you know, and we're on about consistency on, on the field. Calvin's lifestyle's changed, uh, stayed the same, consistent uh, off the field. So that's helped him a lot because he's got good people around him who trust him. Uh, so he trusts and vice versa. Um, and then he's got myself and, and my colleague um, who, who are always there for him, always offer our support. Um, again, you know, whether it's problems he's got off the field, uh, whether it's problems he has off, you know, on the field, but we're always there. So there's, there's many, there's many factors to Calvin why he's been successful. Well, the main reason for me is, is the character he is, you know, he's a tough, he's a tough character. Um, to make a professional footballer and play professional and play, you have to have a certain, uh, mental toughness and, and Calvin's got that he's had many ups and downs himself at Leeds you know the Leeds fans have, have given him a hard time over the years um, but in more recent years um, he, he's done really well um, and, and found a, a position in his in his game that really suits him um, and he and he's flourished in it and, and really learnt that trade and, and that position um, to make him a, a real established Premier League player for me and um, and hopefully an England international for years to come um, but he's, a, he's, he's, he's just an all round good lad who wants to do well at his, at his profession and, um, and is a, just a, a good guy to to deal with on, off the pitch as well He's always come across really well in the interviews and obviously the playing side of things has been uh, more than stepping up. I mean, you don't get the nickname the Yorkshire Perlow for nothing. Uh, it's, it's a great achievement for him and obviously to, to be playing for England, like you say, it's a pinnacle for every footballer. And, and one man who's had a, a major impact on his career other than yourself is uh, Marcelo uh, Bielsa. What impact has he had on, on Ellen Road and, and what's your interactions with him and, and what do people might necessarily not see that makes him different to any other managers? Because for me, I think he is in the world class bracket. There's not many better than him. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I, you know, I think he is a, a world class manager, um, world class coach. I think, you know, his attention to detail and how he does things and how he can get his team to play and 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 literally overpower and dominate teams um, is phenomenal. You know, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable. Now he's a Calvin, I totally agree with you. I think uh, he's brought Calvin on no end. He, he's found a position for Calvin, which, in fairness, has always been his position. Um, and that's always been his strongest position. But no one's really stuck with him at that position. Um, other managers throughout his time there, Christensen, Monk, um, uh, Steve Evans, people like that, never really put him in his rightful position. But it's not just being in that position, it's how the others are and how the team plays that makes him better in that position. And that's clearly down to Bielsa and his tactics and now he sets up his teams. But um, Bielsa has certainly brought him on. He's, he's, I don't have any involvement with him whatsoever, never have done. Um, he doesn't get involved in agents. Uh, he's, he clearly focuses on the team, the players, the squad he's got available. Everyone's it seems are exactly the same. He doesn't really get close to anyone by the sounds of it. He's, you know, he, he treats you all as, look, I, I need to get a result. Um, I'm not going to favour anyone. I'm, you know, I'm not going to dislike anyone to that. He just needs to get the result for Leeds United. And that's how he, that's how he sees it. Um, so very uh, unemotional, really. But um but again, if you're playing well, you're going to stay in the team. And if you do what he says and, and do it consistently, you're going to stay in the team. Um, 
but under Calvin, he's done that. He's done that now under Bielsa for, for quite a few seasons, a couple of seasons now, and um, deservedly so is is where he is now. And I wish him all the best. And I also want to thank you for your time today. It's been fascinating to hear from you from both your playing days and obviously what you're up to now with the the agent side of things. And I'd like to ask you one final question and. It's, it's quite a big question for me because I feel like in football, there's quite a, a bit of a misconception of agents because when you look at the, the bigger pair of agents like your Granola's on and George Mendes, there's quite a negative perception in the general media. What do you think about this and how do you strive to, to change the way people think of agents? Because you obviously must see the stereotypes that agents are greedy, uh, self-absorbed, uh, some of the accusations made on social media. It's quite harrowing towards agents, and and I don't think this is the case. And I imagine you feel the same. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's, it's difficult because you are tarnished with the same brush, unfortunately, in this game. And um, and agents always have had um, sort of a bad name, um, bad reputation, whatever you want to call it. Um, I actually don't concern myself with with any other agents. I don't try and compete with anyone. Um, what we do. Again, myself and my, my colleague, we we do what we feel we have to do to get players and, and help players and, and bring them on board with us. And if we feel that's successful and it works, then it clearly does. You know, I'm, I'm up to now, touch wood, it, it's going to plan. Um, we want to be more successful. And that's not necessarily financially at all. That is with players. Uh, recommendations um, or always good to get players off off the back of your other players because you know you're doing a great job um, but doing our own thing we know what we have to do um, implementing that and trying to educate players um, is the biggest um, thrill if you like for us uh, and seeing them carry it through uh, and and coming out the other end as uh, and being successful um, so forming them relationships with the players and the families is, is paramount to us because ultimately we know we can help them um, forge a career. And again, it might not be at the top league, but it might be at a league league one level or the career, but that's their level, you know, and, and it's nothing wrong with that level. There's nothing wrong with the National League level. There's a lot of good levels out there, but yeah, every player finds a level and finds their maximum ability and a maximum um, amount of uh, uh, of performance levels they they can achieve. And if we can help do that and help keep them there consistently have a long career, that's great. That's unbelievable satisfaction for us. Uh, So so again, I'm not interested in any other agents whatsoever. Unfortunately, like I say, they, whoever does a bad job or does, you know, and, and they're in the media, fortunately, Every agent's looked at, at the, the same, which is which is a shame. But I tend to not um, listen to that and get on with our, our own job. I think that's a great mindset. <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating to hear from you because the amount of honesty that you've shown it is really commendable. And I think it's going to be very useful for anyone who's watching, who's looking to become a football agent, because obviously you have both sides of, of the, the white line and, and the football field. And your experiences have really helped develop your clients and it's great to see and and it's been great to speak to you today. Uh, I wish you all the best and obviously wish all your clients all the best too because obviously there's so many great players in the list you've you've mentioned, the the ones closer to home to me, uh, young uh, Scott Smith, Tom Pierce, but overall as well, Calvin Phillips, let's hope he continues his progression and, and becomes one of the first names on the England team sheet for years to come. But I'd, I'd like to say thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Jay. Cheers, mate. Take care. If you enjoyed this episode of the Full Time Whittle Podcast with Kevin Sharp, please feel free to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. It's much appreciated.